Hello. Um, hope everyone's having a great day. And I have a comment and a question. My name is Deanne Sanchez. I'm from Manti, Utah. Um, that's central Utah. And I want to say thank you to the rabbi for speaking the truth. I came out of Mormonism five to six years ago, and I'm now a born-again Christian. And I just want to say thank you so much for being a light to all the nations. And sadly, I'm, I'm finding that the New Testament has a lot of problems. Do I need to completely renounce Christianity to be saved? And is the Hebrew Bible the actual living written word of God above the Christian Bible? And that those are my thoughts and my questions. Thank you so much, and have a very blessed day. Yeah, you shouldn't say sadly. I've discovered that there are problems in the Christian Bible. You should say happily, because so many of your co-religionists haven't figured it out yet and see the Jewish people as a nuisance at best rather than a light which is the role of the Jew, Isaiah 49, verse 6, Isaiah 42, verse 6, Isaiah 60, verse, well, verse everything. So you really should rejoice. Rejoice that you discovered the God of Israel. You were a Mormon, which is a another accretion of idolatry on top of lowercase o orthodox Christianity. And you are created in the image of Hashem. You're a daughter of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You're a child of God. So of course you should renounce Christianity. Forgive me, don't be offended, but it's like, you ask a doctor, I, you know, I stopped doing heroin, but should I smoke cigarettes? No, it's, 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 of course you should rid yourself of all this. You know, Isaiah uses the language of wash yourself, touch nothing unclean. So, of course, the Christian Bible teaches ideas that the Messiah came and died for your sins. Well, no one could die for your sins. The Almighty loves you, and he has the power to forgive you if you'll talk to him. You know, if you have children, you know how important it is for you to hear from them. You don't want to have an intermediary. So the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, loves you. You're a daughter of Hashem, and he wants to be close to you, and he doesn't want anyone between you and him. No one, just you and him. And all he wants to do is hear your prayers. And as it says in the Bible, do not put your trust in princes or the Son of Man where there is no salvation. The Christian Bible is filled with ideas that are, it's not that they're just inconsistent with the Hebrew Bible. And I'm not interested at all that it is riddled with mistakes. That's not an issue at all. Let's say a Christian Bible, let's say, didn't have mistakes. Let's say there was only one gospel instead of four, so it was internally consistent. Let's just, it would make a difference. The ideas that are laid out in the Christian Bible are at war with Tanakh. And the only thing you should trust in is the word of Hashem, which is the Hebrew Bible. Tanakh is the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ksuvim, the writings. Why it's divided into three parts is not germane right now. That is the word of Hashem. And the Greek Bible is not. And it's not, uh, it's, it is not um, just simply, it fails the test, the standard of the word of God. It is at war with the God of Israel. Meaning, as I explained, the notion that the Messiah is supposed to die and rise on the third day, and if you believe in him, you're saved, and if you don't, you're damned, which it says openly in the Christian Bible. That is all opposed by the prophets of Israel who openly state that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked, 
and that if the wicked person turns away from his sinful ways, Hashem will hear your prayers in heaven, forgive you for all your transgressions. See 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 to 50. And the context there, King Solomon is saying, when you don't have a temple, when you're exiled from the land, no sacrificial system. The idea that the Messiah is supposed to be the Son of God as a deity. Now, one caveat, the Christian Bible, the authors of the Christian Bible did not believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. That's a later Christian development. It's a later Christian it's a self-inflicted wound from which the church has never recovered. Mormonism just spikes it up even more by spreading the notion that the Father somehow uh, caused Mary to become pregnant through a human interaction, through a, a physical interaction. So it's like more on top of more on top of more. So, of course, you should renounce Christianity, but know that Hashem has the power to forgive you. In fact, His mercy exceeds our mercy. And Christians will tell you that you know, God can't forgive you. You're a sinner. He's perfect. You can't. Say this. All this is nonsense. All this is a, a dualism. The notion that God, who's the creator of all things, is inaccessible, and therefore you needed an incarnation. That's what all Christianity is. That Jesus is a mediator, and this its source of this idea is in the Christian canon. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. And it doesn't mean like the Jews didn't have priests. It means that no one comes to the Father but by me. That's John. That's in the Gospels. It's very clearly there. That's all Avodizara. And that's all foreign worship. And, of course, later iterations of Christianity, including the largest denomination, the Roman Catholic Church, they would add more mediators. Jesus isn't enough of a mediator. So the Roman Catholic church would add in Mary as sinless, sinless. This is the Roman Catholic Church teaches. The Orthodox also teaches that she was born without the stain of original sin. I mean, that's the vast majority of Christians. And she's worthy of, ven they call it veneration because they don't, they're trying to make it like a, it's, it's worship. They worship Mary. They call all kinds of names, but they're worshiping Mary. And they add in all kinds of saints and Avedazar, all of that. And all these things is the most disgusting abomination possible because Christians all believe in the Father as the true God. But then they, that means they're married to God. They have that bond with God. They're believers in God. But then they add in another person in the triune Godhead, or two persons. Now, they use odd language, person, so that's a weird. It's an unconventional way of using the word. It's a philosophical term that was developed after the Christian Bible. The Christian Bible was fully written. So the Christian Bible is it's not only at odds, but it is an enemy of Tanakh, People think that the Christian Bible, and I think Christians also understand that the Christian Bible, they view it as just a somewhat different orientation than the Hebrew Bible. It isn't. It's at war with the God of Israel. And it's very important for you today to say, Shema Yisrael Adinoi Eloheinu Adinoi Echod, Deuteronomy 6 4. There's one God. No one else. I serve you alone. I pray to you alone. I kneel to you alone. There's no one else. No one. Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Only the Holy One, blessed be His name. And if you do this, if you do this act of teshuva, of repentance, and say to God, I confess my sins, between you and God, no, you don't need anybody. 
You say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that I sinned against you, don't add anything else, and I regret my sin, I renounce my sin, from here on I will only worship you, I will only pray to you, I will only look to Tanakh as a source of enlightenment and what I believe, not don't pray for the truth. It's a big mistake. I hear Christians talk, so I'm going to pray for the truth. Would you pray? You don't pray for truth. Or else what do you need a Bible for? Don't become a prophet. <laughs> it's really very important because Christians talk that way. They don't mean bad, but they say, I'm going to pray for an answer. What the heck pray for an answer? You don't pray for answers. All the truth is in the Torah, in the Holy Torah. That's it. There's no new mitzvah. There's no new commandment in Isaiah or Jeremiah. None. If they would have added one commandment, they would have been put to death as a false prophet. They only tell you you're putting emphasis here and ignoring this. That's it. They give you advice, but never doctrine, never. Or else what do you need for us? So we don't pray for the truth. You go to Tanakh, and that's so you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not enough to say, I believe in one God. A person say, I believe in one God, but that God's a banana. That's no good. You have to only pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's it. You do ask God, very important, after you have encountered him and recognize him as your only Lord, your only Savior, Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, no one before, no one after, then you do the first thing you do, and every you listen to me, after you acknowledge that you're standing for the Lord of Lord, King of Kings, after you acknowledge him, the first bakasha, the first thing you always ask for, before you ask anything, is wisdom. Always. The first request, not health, not this, not for children, not for man. The first, first you acknowledge who he is. This is the way Chana prayed. This is the way the prophets prayed. First you understand to know before whom you are standing. And the first thing you ask for is wisdom. Always number one, first thing. And then after you have wisdom, because without wisdom you don't even know what to ask for. <laughs> you ask for a wife, you ask for a, a husband. If you have no wisdom, you wouldn't even be able, wouldn't know what to look for in a man. So you need wisdom. That you ask for, but never doctrine, never, 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 never are going to pray for the truth. Don't do that. The sudden, if you do that, Sutton is so happy he's got a customer. <laughs> really, If Sutton sees someone is saying, Lord, would you show me the truth? It's like a guy who's a shopkeeper, and he sees a rich person walk in who's got all kinds of jewelry and a big fat wallet. He right away closes the door after the customer walks in, puts on the clothes, locks it so no one else can bother him, and he knows he's going to have a great customer there. The perfect customer is someone who's going to pray for the truth. Don't ever do that. You pray for wisdom, and then you pray for health and other things and the redemption and so on, but first wisdom. So it's very important if you, at this moment, now, you talk to HaKadosh Baruch say, I confess my sin, I renounce my sin, and I will worship you alone. Never again will I worship, venerate anything else, anyone else. Don't walk into a church. It's not a holy thing. Stay far away from it as you can and worship him. Not only will HaKadosh Baruch Hu immediately forgive you, but if you do that out of love, out of love. Now, there are many reasons people repent. They do it out of fear, too. And that's great. If you do it out of fear, it's a great thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't. But, but if you do tshuva me'ahava, which means you repent out of love for God, not because you're afraid of the consequences, out of a pure act of love, every sin that you ever committed, every time you went to church in your life, in your former life, turns into a mitzvah. It's an amazing thing. It is very good to repent because you just you fear punishment nothing wrong with that but if you do it as a pure act of love wow so my dear sister turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu now serve him alone praise him alone your mouth is holy now and may HaKadosh Baruch Hu 
inspire you to inspire the world that we should see the redemption, the coming of the true Messiah quickly in our time. Thank you. If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, Beterem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechef Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, Veacharei Kiklot Akol, לבדו, אם לא כנועה, והוא היה, והוא עובד.